else we got? Not much else. Still nobody's joined yet. Oh, here we go. Here's Mark. And we're getting going here. 1201. And let me just get that up and running. All right, so this is the ethics, analytics, and duty of care live session for November 1, 2021. Hi, Mark. Good morning, Stephen, or good afternoon in your case. Yeah, afternoon. I'm going to crank up the volume a wee bit here so I can hear you. <laughs> Did you have a fun Halloween? I did. Good. Had nothing to do with Halloween, but I went to a barbecue with some friends, and uh, it was a good uh, Sunday afternoon. Very nice. We had one trick-or-treater. One. Uh, we had two. Three, oh, two, yeah. Although I shouldn't complain. That's one more than we had last year. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe they'll come out again. Yeah, we were in a kind of a hilly neighborhood and a, and a house with a, a big uphill approach from the street to the house. Oh, oh yeah. Um, so I asked, so, so one of the guests insisted that we had candy for the kids yeah. because we went shopping for the barbecue. Um, and uh, so I said, okay, so what do you think the over on this is? I'll say two. <laughs> and uh, luckily I didn't bet any money because I lost. We had two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we went, and I'm very proud of myself, we went full-sized candy bars this year instead of mini bars. So I think that's a step forward. Um, well, unless you're trying to reduce your candy intake, because now you're you're one candy bar less than whatever you had yesterday. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Now we've got two full boxes of full size candy bars. Yeah. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, I like both types: <laughs> Kit Kat and Maltesers. Maltesers must be a Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, their little round chocolate uh, covered malt, like sort of, it's hard to describe. It's like sort of like a malt candy. It um, has the same sort of consistency as sponge toffee, but doesn't taste at all like that. It tastes like malt, as in, you know, like if you went for a malt shake. Yeah, we call Delicious. those malt balls generically. They're oh, okay. Malt. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are different brands available. I like those too, but that's why I don't buy them. <laughs> and we've got Sharita joining us. I don't know how long I was staring at the Sharita's waiting to join you in the waiting room, but. Yeah, I heard a little noise less than a minute ago, so. Okay, well, I hope she wasn't waiting too long. If so, I'm sorry for either. I was only staring straight at the screen. Can't expect me to see something that shows up on the screen. <laughs> there we are. There we are. I got in a different way this time. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I went to the activity center, yeah. and it wasn't going to let me in there. So I went to just the, you know, the, the week that we're covering and wow. I got in through there. Yeah, those links will always work because I've scheduled them all ahead of time. The activity center, I sort of have to do at the last minute. Yeah. And uh, if you're getting an older or cached version of that, I really should exactly. figure out how to automate the activity center. I think that would make a lot of sense. 
because it's silly that I have to update that every day. It's right. Like, you know, and it's just one thing, and you know, it doesn't matter how many people are actually taking the move. It's just one thing that I have to do. But still, it'd be better if it was zero things. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this week we have ethical codes. And uh, I'm very sorry to report that I've done a detailed study of ethical codes and have summaries of more than 70 of them. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so, and you'll need to read all of, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, no one would expect you to read all of them, but um, I'm sending out a link in uh, today's newsletter, and I'll give it to you here in the chat room right now, uh, to basically what I call the ethical code reader. Oops. Make list post. I'm just trying to find it here because I didn't have it right handy because that would be too easy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Copy link. All right. Um, no, I've lost. <laughs> I upgraded to Windows 11 over the weekend. Oh, Nothing's oh, where oh. it's supposed to be anymore. <laughs> All right. Um, especially like the taskbar is wrong. Okay, so I've put I've posted the link to the post in the chat. If you go there and click on the title "Ethical Codes Reader," you'll be taken to it. Uh, it's it's a long Google Docs link, but you'll see. It's uh, broken into two parts. The first part is just the summaries of all the different codes, and I've organized them into the discipline. And then the second part is uh, the code itself. Um, in some cases, I've reproduced the entire code in the document. Uh, in other cases, when the codes ran to like 10 pages or whatever, I extracted the most relevant parts and put those into the documents. So that's our object of study this week. Um, but like I say, uh, we have the benefit of the analysis that I've already done on them. And I'll be sharing that through the week. Um, and I have some slides today uh, to give you that, just provide an overview to give you a handle on this, uh, if that's all right with you. If it's not all right with you, tell me. <laughs> uh, because, you know, just presenting slides is probably the most boring kind of activity you can have. Uh, but I think this is useful information and will be helpful. Um, but before I do that, uh, I want to see if you have any comments or reflections on what we've done to this point in the course. I know I threw that question out there with zero warning that it was yeah. coming. <laughs> so yeah, if there's a rule for good quality online learning uh, delivery. Any rule that exists, I've broken it <laughs> just once, probably numerous times. But uh, well, I think just the existence of this course breaks <laughs> every rule. Yeah. yeah. Be but because they're bad rules. It's not well, there is that, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like some of these rules I've never really been able to comprehend. Like the I and and I'm all in favor of personal learning. Uh, you know, uh, learner-centered learning, 
learner autonomy, etc. But nobody has ever taken a course from me for that reason. Um, typically, they're looking to get some body of information, uh, which I hopefully possess, or can at least point them to. Um, and there's that contradiction, right? You know, I mean, um, you know, I've done all this work in ethics and learning analytics, and I'm trying to share that. I can't share that if I just sort of sit back and, okay, tell me what you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> just, it just doesn't work. Um, so there has to be the presentation part of this. And I've learned to accept that over time because, you know, I've, I've done courses, I, I've done presentations and workshops where I've tried the other way and basically people rebel and they're saying, you know, we're not in this room just to talk to each other. We can do that anytime. And I think that's a point. I mean, I want your reactions and comments to this stuff because otherwise there's no point in me doing it. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and certainly I think it aids in our learning, but there has to be stuff to react to and comment against. At least that's my feeling. Okay, so now you've triggered a reaction. <laughs> oh, there's definitely value to the reaction because as I mentioned previously, I mean, the shape of this course, this, this course is changing shape as we go through it based on those reactions. So it's certainly helpful to me and informative to me. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to claim to be the first person that took the course just to explore his own agency. Yep. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, do I have to then, you know, be a smart ass and say, I don't care what you know. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. Maybe um, that comes with the territory. I don't know. But I, mean, I don't know. I, I feel like I kind of know you, so I can kind of tell that. But then it's being recorded, yeah. so I shouldn't have. But whatever. Well, um, yeah. So I'm in a traditional online course from a very liberal state college in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and perfectly qualified, nice professor uh, mm -hmm. teaching online uh, and not her first time because of last year. Yeah. And yeah. yet we post once reply to two comments every week. <laughs> um, you know, so it is what it is. Um, yeah. And it's an intercultural communication. So uh, this <laughs> week, uh, will be very helpful because I've been struggling with defining my own ethics and working class culture mm. inside of a very bourgeois situation. Uh, in fact, last week I did a literature uh, search for working class culture. Mm. Oh, yeah, good. Nothing out there. Nothing out there. Almost, you see, I'm overstating. Yeah, I know. Very don't. little peer-reviewed, yeah. academically published work on yeah. the culture of the American working class. Yeah. Uh, I believe that. Yeah, I'm not surprised. A lot of the British, but yes, almost yes. zero on my, my culture, which yeah. I'm tasked with describing. And yeah. so your ethical search, uh, even being centered in Canada, is going to be very helpful. Yeah. Anyway, back to the education and student agency. So in that institution, this is my last formal class I have to take mm -hmm. because, and I've explained this to you, Stephen, but I'll explain to Sharita. I'm the first person this state university in Minnesota has approved of completing a bachelor's degree in my case, um, using prior learning demonstrated on my own website, on Good my for own you. domain, Yep. for their assessment for credit. Very good. So I'm the rat in the lab. <laughs> that's, that's excellent because, um, you know, people talk about it all the time, but they don't put it into practice. Yep. 
um and that you were able to do it is just wonderful yeah well to get approved now there's the doing it ah okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> now we're i'm taking because of course you have to uh conform to all of their uh, uh i'm missing the term uh you know you have to have the different categories of classes yeah, yeah. so i lack their globalism category so i I'm taking intercultural yeah. uh, communication. And uh, then you have to have a certain amount of classes from them for the degree. And those are the ones I'm fulfilling yeah. Yeah. with the prior learning assessment, except for, um, and it is sort of, a, it's an interdisciplinary program. So there's an intro course and an exit capstone mm -hmm. course. But those are the only uh, online courses I have to pay because those three. Uh -huh. uh, and then the rest is the prior learning. So now the task is to sit down and write up all this experience that I have, which I'm yeah. finding daunting. But you'll find I think that's probably as hard as doing the course. <laughs> yeah. Well, according to my advisor, that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then because once you submit it for approval, you've done most of the work. So then it's just yeah. them getting a subject matter expert, me posting it on my website. So there's yeah. you know, another bit of work. But yeah. then uh, I mean, it's in balls in their court, so it's going to be interesting to see. Hmm. Yeah. And I've studied, because I came to higher education as an adult uh, a decade ago um, and had such a terrible experience uh, beyond belief. Um, really, I tell the story of people like, I don't know, are you sure that's what happened? Um, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, it was a terrible experience. So I've been studying higher education for adults from the point of view of, you know, old people, um, yeah. people with experience and agency. Um, and because if you push back against the institution, if you try to apply your uh, agency to an institution as a student, they fight you know, back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They fight dirty. And there's a lot of them and they have the money. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, so this book that I'll never get around to writing, just about that, just about being a student leader at pushing 60 back then, um, and the treatment of not just me, but uh, the whole student uh, council when, when we really started pushing them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so I'm particularly interested in learning management systems and distance education. And so circling back, um, I'm in this course just to experience it and to help co-build it and to see where it goes uh, because this is the future. You know, yeah. that, um, I, don't, Sarita, I don't know if you know Brian Alexander. Go ahead. I do. I, I, I follow him on Twitter. Good. Um, and he has a, a weekly um, Zoom. Well, it's not Zoom. He uses a different platform, but he has a yes. weekly. Yes, I've seen uh, that. I haven't joined it, but yeah. Oh, you should. Yeah, um, okay. Forum for Educators. Oh, he brings in, you know, I mean, now he's at Georgetown. I mean, he's a, he's a big shot now. Oh, um, okay. But yeah, when he's he lived in a cabin in the woods, he was doing really <laughs> good work. Yeah, that, that's what I was saying. George, I'm thinking Georgetown, but I envision yeah. him, you know, in the woods someplace. Yeah, right? no, he moved to Georgetown a couple of years ago. Um, wow. And... Um, yeah, and he uses a platform that's actually more conducive to this type of work. Uh, Shindig. Shindig, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's more interactive than Zoom, although Zoom has moved in that direction. Yeah. Um, but Shindig's a, a much better platform. But anyway, so now I've lost my train of thought. Um, Brian. Um, oh, uh, he's been <laughs> tracking the closing of higher education institutions. Oh, yeah. yeah most of a decade now. And yeah. the dirty secret that he talks about is one a week in North America closes for the last several years. One yeah. higher institution a week. Mergers, closes. That. That's, that's worth noting. Yeah. And double check me on that, you know. I, yeah. Um, but that's my understanding is about one a week. Um, the oldest women's college uh, west of Mississippi here in California just Close. I mean, it's just shocking that the colleges are closing. 
Well, it's like news media, uh, you know, and I remember very clearly people saying, you know, newspapers aren't going to go away. They're too valuable to society. People yeah. won't let them close down. And yet uh, the sector has been, you know, more than decimated. It's been diminished to a shadow of its former self. Um, and, uh, you know, people get news sadly from places like Facebook and Twitter or yeah. happily from my newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I do get news from your newsletter and I get a lot of news from comedians on YouTube. They're actually yeah. doing a better job of independent media. Yeah. It's sad, but it's true. That's where it's going on. And now there's all these platforms emerging. Uh, you know, not just Medium is, is the big one right now, but uh, Substack and yeah. And now there's Rumble, some new uh, yeah. video platform that people are moving off of YouTube to because YouTube is, I mean, uh, yeah, YouTube, um, Google is shutting down a lot of these platforms and censoring them. It's the word is censorship. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. So, which should be a big deal in America, but it isn't for some reason right now. Anyway, well, <laughs> far be it for me to comment on American politics. I do have my opinions, but I'm sure yeah. Americans aren't interested in this. Them. Is, this is neither the time nor the place. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so why, why don't I do the thing on ethical codes while we still okay. have time left in our hour? Uh, okay, let me just set this up here. It always takes a few seconds because... Maybe it'll take a little longer today because new windows. Uh, slide so I'm going to ask Sharita while you're clicking around. Um, yeah. Can you jump in um, either on last week or on uh, uh, the whole this learning? Um, can I jump in? Hmm. Well, let me say something then. Um, having joined this course and having had the discussions. Um, with you and Stephen over the past, what has it been, three weeks? This is the beginning of the fourth? Yeah. yeah. Um, really got me thinking about, um, one, the way I have taught in the past. Mm -hmm. And two, I mean, I retired about a year and a half ago, just when COVID hit. I Good. <laughs> <laughs> which was dumb. Uh, but anyway, um, and I really, I really found that I was enjoying what I was reading and what I was doing. Mm. And it was, you know, very much for me, you know, some form of mental stimulation, especially if I'm really shut off. So as a result of this, um, I was approached by someone from, uh, my old faculty who said, is there any possibility, Sharita, that you would teach online this winter? And uh -huh. I said, yes. <laughs> yeah. So what it's done for me is it stimulated all of that. And I know from what we're talking about and, you know, how the, the you know, the connectivist MOOC works, that I'll probably ap apply a lot of that in, in terms of, uh, you know, my teaching this winter. Cool. So I'm very surprised that I've done this, but I've done it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I hope we can get a report back on how much of what you've learned is allowed to be used in <laughs> your learning management You know, system. after you're retired, <laughs> uh, they don't have a lot of influence on you. <laughs> and they, they never really had a lot of influence on me to begin with. I always, I've always done what I wanted to do within parameters, obviously, but yeah. always done it, so. Good, good. All right, so let's let's start this puppy. Oh, this needs to be over here. You're you're making me feel like I should not upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It's um, it's more me being 
disorganized <laughs> and then windows and, and have you spent the entire day it takes to get your settings all back the way you want like you said taskbar i spent yeah i spent a good part of saturday messing around with that i had plans but uh okay i'm gonna try an experiment here see if it actually records okay i probably shouldn't have experimented live <laughs> uh, are you guys still able to see it yeah yeah all right well and it says uh, live on YouTube up in the corner, and I'm watching yeah. on Zoom, so I'm guessing everything's working. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so here we go. This is ethical codes, and uh, all right, there we go. I've, I've recovered. I have notes off to the side as well, and it covered them all up, which bothered me. So, um, so. I don't have as many images in these slides as I usually do, and I feel guilty about that, but not so guilty that I won't give these slides. Uh, ethical codes. Now, I, I should probably have a slide saying what they are, but uh, basically uh, different professions bring together statements, which they call ethical codes, that describe the conduct expected of them as professionals or as members of an association or as a type of person, it varies. We'll talk about that. So the first thing that I looked at is why they're doing this in the first place. Now, again, uh, I don't have references here. This is a summary of the ethical codes that I looked at. And there's, you know, you'll see those in the ethical codes reader, but this is me pulling that information out of those 70 statements. Um, now, there are many more than 70 out there in the world. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. And so uh, I'm not sure how statistically representative these generalizations are, but I can say, that these generalizations exist. That is to say, there is a non-zero number of ethical codes that have expressed these reasons for existing. That's me being really precise. I'm persnickety that way sometimes. So um, five major reasons. First, there's a concern that without a statement of ethics, unethical conduct will abound. I personally think that's ridiculous. Uh, because unethical people won't be stopped by an ethical code. <laughs> Nonetheless, you see this expressed. Um, there is this concern that people will just be unethical unless they're told not to be unethical. Um, more to the point and more widely expressed, I think, is that they're less concerned about good behavior, properly so-called, than they are about the bottom line. You see numerous codes of ethics say that, you know, in order to you know, actually get clients, we have to be trusted. And in order to be trusted, we have to do such and such. And if we're not trusted, we're not going to have clients and the business will fail. That sort of reasoning. There are some services and institutions that actually require these ethics in order to function. You can't perform your accounting function as an accountant unless your client trusts you. It's just not possible to do the job. Similarly with law and lawyers, there are many functions that a lawyer undertakes as, as your agent uh, that that lawyer cannot take unless you actually trust them to do that properly. Uh, in other cases, and I, I found this especially in education and education-related cases, uh, disciplines see ethical codes as essential to being recognized as a profession. So if, and the, the reasoning is this, um, one of the things that distinguishes between a profession and some other occupation is that a profession is self-regulating. 
So that's why, you know, you have doctors associations, lawyer associations, the bar, accountants associations, etc. Even like plumbers, the International Plumbers Union or whatever they're called. Um, so in order to be self-governing, you need some kind of governance structure. And at least a part of this governance structure is a code of ethics. And then finally, the last argument is practitioners actually need them. And that's, I, I can actually see that one. Um, sometimes practitioners are faced with dilemmas. They don't actually know what is the ethical course to take. Uh, you see that especially in research ethics. You know, is it, is it ethical to perform research on your students? Well, it really depends on what you're doing. Um, you know, if you just ask them what they think about something, uh, you know, what's your favorite color, where there's zero consequences, that's probably fine. But if you ask them, you know, what do you think of me teaching this class right before the exam? Probably not fine. Uh, and you need some kind of guidance. You know, those are really obvious examples, but, you know, they're pretty gray areas sometimes in ethical codes. Sometimes, not always, sometimes help with that distinction. So here's an interesting thing, I think. Ethical codes are largely about standards of conduct. Um, and they're typically characterized as imposing a higher standard of conduct than you would expect from a non-professional. Now, I, I sort of wonder about that. I don't see why this standard can't be applied to everyone, but you know, I, I, it's part of the idea of distinguishing the professions from other people. Some of these codes, by no means all of them, are normative. And what that means is they instruct you as to what you should do and carry penalties, you know, sanctioned by your association if you don't do it. Uh, I labor over that because the word normative is very often misinterpreted to mean normal. And it does not mean normal. It means uh, an obligation that is imposed on you. So normative ethics, for example, is the ethics of duty and obligation. But the intent of these codes isn't to be normative. It isn't to enforce the ethics, although they will if they have to. The intent is usually just to remind professionals of their duties and to you know, distinguish the profession as a profession. So it's important to note that while ethical codes are sort of related to legal obligations, they're not the same as legal obligations. And it's that distinction is going to become important later on in the course when we use the phrase duty of care, because there are two distinct meanings of the word duty or of the phrase duty of care. One is a legal principle. Uh, a professional or any contractor has a legal duty of care toward their client. But the other is the ethical principle, which is more explicit about what care means and the origins of care and what the practice of care is. And that distinction applies here as well in ethics and ethical codes. There is this distinction between legal requirements and ethical requirements, even if the ethical requirements carry a penalty. So overall, now, and this is one, this is not 100 percent the case, but it's a generally accepted characterization. Codes are divided by what can be called values and principles. And then in the diagram there, we have practices, are, which are the actual implementation of these. Um, the values are general moral values, honesty, trustworthiness, etc. We'll talk about those more in this module, but not so much today. Principles are the ethical conditions or the behaviors that we expect. 
And as Cooper wrote, an ethical principle is a statement concerning the conduct or state of being that is required for the fulfillment of a value. It explicitly links a value with a general mode of action. So the value, say, is honesty. The principle is do not lie to your client. You see the distinction? Um, the, the principle refers to some type of activity, or it can also refer to a condition or a characterization, but, but something that instantiates the value. And then the practices are the individual acts. So a practice might be, um, I'm, I don't lie to my clients. And the principle is don't lie to your clients. So it's moving at the bottom, very general to very particular. I think this iceberg is actually upside down in a sense. Uh, there are usually very few values expanded into more principles, expanded into a large number of practices. Unfortunately, uh, such an iceberg would just tip over. <laughs> so the physics have to be respected. So sometimes you'll see ethical codes explicitly set up this way. More than half the time you won't but you can kind of extract the values, um, maybe from a preamble or something like that, or more generally from the actual principles that are described. So even coming into this, without even looking at the codes, uh, there are some questions we need to ask. And my, oh, <laughs> It says why, but it should say who. Uh, who writes the codes? Um, this matters a lot, as it turns out. Um, I've read a number of codes of ethics that were clearly written by the employer, um, uh, as opposed to the people in question. And they contain things like, you must never do anything that tarnishes the reputation of the employer and uh, employees have an ethical obligation to do what their manager instructs. I'm not exaggerating. There, there are, I, I did see actual codes like that. Um, sometimes they're written by the association in question. Sometimes, very frequently, uh, they're written by the association in question. They may hire consultants to help them, but the actual body creating and approving the code are the people to whom the code applies. Uh, you know, lawyers write law codes, doctors write medical codes, teachers write teaching codes. I can't recall an instance uh, where the code is written, in, even in part, by the clients. Mm. So we, we don't see the clients writing the ethical codes for lawyers or doctors or whatever. And we certainly don't see the students writing ethical codes for teachers or professors. It just doesn't happen. Never seen it. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, because, you know, I haven't sampled every single code out there, but I haven't seen it. Um, and then... The other question is, how do they differ? Not presupposes that they differ. Um, and one of the uh, conclusions to be drawn here in this module is these codes do differ, and I'll come back to that. But I think it's worth thinking about how they can differ, uh, just as a guide to investigation. The motivation and the purpose that we've looked at already, the interests that are represented, uh, when we ask who writes the codes, for example, the burden or the responsibility for acting or carrying out the obligations described in the code. Uh, we're having an internal discussion even now about disclosure rules for research data that's collected. And the question comes up, well, whose responsibility is it? Uh, is it the individual researchers? That seems a little unfair given how little they control the computer environment. Is it the computer services people? Well, that's kind of unfair because they're not even involved in the research. 
Um, so there's a complex question here. And then enforcement, um, whether it's internal, whether it's ex external, whether there are appeals possible, um, and so on. Important questions, I think. Uh, I threw an economics diagram in there just because that's what came up when I did a search on values and priorities on Google, which tells me something in and of itself. Um, so I'm not going to run through the list of values and principles informing these ethical codes in this presentation. I have a long list, and I'm actually going to create a set of data elements so that we can graph those, because why not? That will be fun and informative, I think. Uh, related to that are the, the bases, or I don't want to say fundamental principles, because that's not quite right. But you know, if you have, say, honesty as a value, uh, you know, and the value is basic in ethics, right? In these ethical codes, the, the question does come up though, uh, why should we be honest? Just, just what is the basis for an ethical principle of honesty? Uh, you could argue that honesty is a virtue in and of itself, and there are philosophers who have argued that. Uh, but there are many other ways that we can think of uh, as reasons why we should be honest, whether it has to do with character, virtue, uh, utilitarian purposes, like uh, you know, avoiding bad consequences, etc. So all of these values and all of these principles are tied to different bases. And we'll look at that briefly in this module. We'll look at it in more detail in the next module quite a bit more detail. So we have that coming to look forward to. Um, another interesting question um, has to do with the research subject or the client. And again, I mentioned earlier, the clients never write these things. Sometimes they sort of do, but it depends on the client. People like students or patients don't write these things, but there are numerous clients for research. For example, an employer or a funder who very often will set the ethical parameters. Sometimes the research subject actually consists of colleagues, unions, or professional associations. They're researching themselves. Uh, sometimes the client is quote unquote stakeholders. What we mean by stakeholders varies a lot according to circumstances. Um, and, and we could talk about that. We will talk about that more later on in the last few modules of the course when we talk about, you know, whose interests are being represented, who's writing the codes uh, and, and, and why, what their, what their motivations are. There's a whole class of clients, of codes that have as clients, people like publishers or content providers, copyright holders in general. Uh, this reflects, I think, the last 20 years of campaigning on behalf of those copyright owners to instill respect for copyright as an ethical or moral principle and not just a legal principle. Some codes view society as a whole, as a stakeholder, um, and therefore a recipient of ethical behavior. Others, law and country, there are, there's no small number of ethical codes that talk about patriotic duty as being a core ethical value. And I saw one uh, that mentioned the environment as the recipient of ethical behavior. Stephen, uh, yeah. can I interrupt for a second? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, in the previous slide, you say research subjects, and also you were talking about clients. Yeah. To me, a research subject and a client may not be the same. That's true, yeah, and, okay. and I was a bit confused there. Sorry, I'm having trouble. I no longer have the capacity to back up my slides. 
it gives me next but not previous. Sorry about yeah. that. That's really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> but you're you're absolutely right. Um, and I I tried to think of ways to separate those out because you'd think they were easily separated out, but they're not. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so I had to put them all in a big bowl together. Um, because, you know, like if we think of an action, uh, there's, you know, the, the person who commits the action and then there's the object or person to whom the action is committed on, um, which is the object of that action. And so this is trying to characterize the object of that action. If it's just a simple cause effect sort of thing, then it's pretty easy to find the object. Mm -hmm. It's whoever you affected. But if we're taking effect to include um, ethical consequences, then the scope of this object broadens considerably and, and the boundaries within it really fuzzify. Okay. And, and I know that sounds sort of weird, but but that's what I found. Okay. And you know, it's it's you know, it's like, for example, uh, unethical medical research has an impact not just on the people you are conducting this research on, but on wider society. And that's a truism that we obtained from the Nuremberg trials, right? It's not just a you versus that person thing. So the client of this unethical medical research has to include on whose behalf you conducted the research, the person on which you conducted the research and the wider society that either benefits from or is harmed from the research. They are all clients, as odd as that sounds. And they all therefore become the object of that research. That's, okay. I, and I don't think I can draw, I mean, we can draw them apart intuitively, yeah. I, you know, the, the person who paid for the research or the person who benefits is clearly different from the person who you're doing the research on. But when you actually try to apply that distinction in any sort of principled way, it falls apart. Okay. So even, even like the, uh, the unethical medical research, right, might benefit the person on whom it's being done. I mean, that's the basis for like a gazillion science fiction stories. <laughs> Okay, so I can't go backwards. You have to come out of full screen to go backwards. It seems. Yeah, and that will probably stop the slide recording that I was experimenting with. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, I've forgotten what that previous slide was, but oh yeah, the, the commonality. Uh, and the slide quotes from the uh, Canadian Psychological Association Code of Ethics that says everybody should be treated the same regardless of, and then there's a long list of factors, including gender, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, race, language, religion, etc. And I made the observation, no other code contains that list so prima facie they're not all the same because we have this one that has a list that is completely unique to itself but even within these um, you have a lot of codes that do advocate for discrimination on the basis of various factors including race including nationality including language and and I could go on through the list um, so just simply by looking at that one phrase, we will be able to observe differences in these ethical codes. Um, when we look at them in more detail, as we will through the rest of the week, um, 
I think you will be convinced that simply from a study of ethical codes, which presumably is where we would find the most commonality, the greatest degree of consensus, we cannot find a great degree of consensus. In fact, we can't find consensus at all. You'd think we could. And people talk like we can, but an actual empirical study of these codes, I argue, shows that we cannot. And I think that's a really significant and important finding because it means that uh, you know, the ethics, as opposed to legal obligations, which do apply to everyone and represents a different sort of consensus, but ethics, uh, we don't have a common understanding of ethics, which makes it very difficult, even in particular professions, to identify a code which characterizes those ethics. Now, there are also other problems with ethical codes, which I'll talk about in more general detail as we go through this. But I think that's the main thing that I want to say coming out of this module. Um, we can't achieve consensus. We won't achieve consensus simply by creating yet another ethical code. All we will do is add to the pile of codes that disagree with each other. Um, and the proof of that's in the reader, which is why it exists. Um, so there's the link. Um, it's, it's also, cat scratching at my door for lunch, uh, but it's also, um, it's also in the newsletter today. And uh, you know, have a look. Uh, you don't need to read all the codes in detail, but it, you know, the, uh, the, I have short descriptions of them. Those are a fairly easy read, and they'll give you a sense of what these codes are about. But if you really want to see the proof, of course, you'll need to read all the codes or my argument thereof. Uh, I've got a paper that I'll be linking to as well. I also, I'm also going to link to you a study of ethical codes in um, data and analytics specifically, or learning analytics specifically, uh, which is interesting because the premise of that paper is there is a consensus but then when you look at the actual codes, the actual details of the different values, you find that consensus is like 23% consensus um, and hardly a full consensus at all. But I'll talk about that in, in a different session in one of the videos that I do this week. So that's her, the slide deck. Uh, I call it her because I called her a puppy to begin. <laughs> uh, comments, reactions? Okay, let, let, me, let me ask a more directed question. Um, before this presentation, had you thought much about ethical codes at all in the first place. Nods? Nodding, yeah. Nodding isn't really good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But, but from a, a very uh, limited, I yeah. think, point of view, given I'm looking at all the various ethical, you yeah. know. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, I've gotten a little bit deeper when I, when I taught uh, methods, when I yeah. taught, you know, research methods, mm -hmm. I felt that, you know, students really needed to learn that you, you know, don't do just do research, you actually have to think of the ethics, yeah. you know, in terms of what you're doing. But looking at all this list, no. <laughs> yeah. That's, and that's characteristic. That's what I found, that, that the, the people who are interested in a particular code are interested in that narrow yeah. sphere and, and not the wider sphere. And it, it creates this illusion 
when I'll say it like that, this illusion of consensus where it probably doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Because everybody in the room agrees, but they never ask anyone outside the room. Right. And especially since that they... Um, ethical codes, as you were saying, are usually, um, they're not discussed with the people where the ethical codes have some kind of impact. Yeah. Right? Patients, you know, students. Yeah, yeah I've been thinking about uh, ethical codes, but from a different point of view, um, as a student, I've been asked, especially in this program I'm in, you know, to think about and try to uh, elaborate uh, mm -hmm. my values and ethics. And I'm finding it particularly difficult because they're back to the working class culture, lack of research problem. Yeah. Um, I cannot find documentation on the overlapping groups of codes that I was brought up under. Um, and I, I'm finding that a real problem. So I'm interested in this, but of course you're more concerned with institutional uh, codes and I'm more interested in cultural codes. So we'll see how much overlap there is. That'd be interesting. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for instance, um, I only knew one set of grandparents. I'll try to make this brief. And one of my grand, my grandfather was a Presbyterian deacon from Inverness, Scotland. Yeah. And he married the daughter of a Texas cowboy homesteader, Indian fighter, true settler, an, an actual mm -hmm. settler, not mm -hmm. what we talk about today, not people born in hospitals that live in, in apartments yeah. uh, mm -hmm. on unceded territory, but an actual settler that fought his way to a river and kept it. Yeah. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how those codes intersect with my California public education in the 60s mm -hmm. in Los Angeles when I was running around Hollywood in the summertime. There's, you know, that's an interesting Venn diagram, but I cannot find anything written about any one of those subsets. No. Or very little, again, very little. I think that's an important point, and, and, and it's actually not one that I had considered, but I, I ought to consider. I mean, we're all familiar with things like, you know, the code of the road or, or you know, uh, the code of behavior among athletes. And uh, I have even got a thing in, uh, in the hopper or something along the lines of uh, breaking the rules in a sport, uh, you know, violates some sort of code. Uh, above and beyond the penalty that you suffer within the uh, the event itself, uh, you know that you don't win that way. Um, you know, and and like you, I have my own, if you will, working class code. Uh, I view the long hair as part of that. Uh, you know that that's reflective to me uh, of the culture that I came from, and it's a very distinct culture from, quite frankly, any of these professional associations that I studied, uh, including associations that I belong to. And, uh, you know, my code says things like, uh, you know, advertising poorly or bad food, like McDonald's, to children is morally wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think that's a lot more morally wrong than, than many of the advertising standards that exist today. Um, things like that, you know. Um, putting candy next to the checkout at the supermarket down candy at the uh, eye level of the yeah. situation. That's yeah. more morally reprehensible in my book. Yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, if, if your ethical code says that a refugee child must die in the AGNC, your moral code is wrong. Uh, that seems to me, to me, to seem pretty basic. And yet, um, you know, the prevailing ethics of our time allow that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you brought up research and education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to me right now, 
the probably the largest violation in all of human history. And how's that for? <laughs> um, there's a word to that. I, I can't think of it. Uh, beyond overstating. Um, is going on right now in that the debate is whether to give children an experimental genetic um, therapy disguised as a vaccine across the world. We're talking a billion possible children, I don't know, close to a billion. Um, and it is an experimental genetic therapy um, that they're now calling a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And uh, educators in the United States, and I assume in Canada, are discussing whether they will go into the classroom without every child being vaccinated. And so that institution, it's not a single institution, obviously, um, is at this point promoting this experimental genetic therapy being, being injected in children. To me, that I'm going to read the Nuremberg Ethics again. That, you know, to me just seems beyond. That's you know. where ethics becomes contextual for me, mm -hmm. right? That's where it becomes um, uh, doing something for the greater good. Now, don't ask me, you know, what that good might be, but that's where I would you know, come from. Yeah. So here's the, the issue is the practice is getting ahead of the ethics, in my opinion. Um, if they distribute hundreds of millions of shots this year mm -hmm. and then sort it out later, that to me is unethical. Uh, in Europe, they have the, uh, what is that principle uh, that you, that you don't do something until you assess the harm of it. And that, uh, I want to say, sounds like sounds like proprietary, uh, uh, cautionary. The cautionary principle um, right. would seem to apply here. And then um, I have to say, let's look at the research that says that children below the age of twelve have very very little chance of being affected by being affected severely by being infected with COVID. And we don't know what the long-term effects of this experimental genetic research will produce. And so there is some research being published that, that lays out um, the effects on children because now millions of children have gotten COVID and um, very few have died, very, very few. Uh, most of them had leukemia, uh, severe breathing issues to begin with. And so then you have to balance that against what is the greater good and who's greater good? Uh, those, anyway, yeah. those well, here are we are. I mean, questions. We're in an ethical dilemma as, yeah. as a civilization at this point, since they're pushing this worldwide. So I'm not going to weigh in on this um, because I don't want to argue. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it does, again, underlie the point that, um, you know, our ethics aren't decided. Um, you know, I mean, even if, and, and, you know, Mark, I think you and I, if we, if we did an analysis at a certain level, we'd be inclined to say that we have very similar, if not the same, standards of ethics. And yet, in a particular case, we might reach very different conclusions, despite having more or less the same evidence. And I find that really interesting. Um, I, I find that less problematic than you might expect, particularly for someone who really thinks ethics is important and that people should be ethical, especially myself. Um, but, uh, you know, I, to me, it's a fund fundamental empirical fact that people have different senses of ethics and we have to work from there. 
and and how do we do that and and how does each person's sense of ethics weigh in and to my mind a lot of a lot of these ethical codes if not all of them are attempts to shortcut that process all right uh the actual determination of ethics in a society or even in a in a professional discipline are very messy like ridiculously messy and Sharita, as you said very often context dependent mm -hmm. um you know and, and even like mark your context and my context they're very different uh, and the overall information surround and environment that you have is very different from mine. Um, uh, in, in, in our society, what you just expressed would be very much a minority position. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but it means it's very much a minority position. Yeah. Um, Same here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, you know, that doesn't mean you just simply say, okay, well, we'll cast that position aside and go with the majority. That's a very old style of thinking that doesn't work in a complex society. That's part of my argument for the overall course, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, we can't shortcut the process by drafting ethical principles um, because they will be seen to be, and indeed are, uh, arbitrary in some cases unfair and in most cases unjustified. Um, no, of course, that presumes the ethical values of non-arbitrariness, fairness, and justification. You can see how this can get circular in a hurry. That's always been the problem with ethics. So part of the challenge of this course to me is to get out of that circular reasoning. How do we get out of that? Because it is a trap we can easily fall into, you know. Well, you know, say, well, it's, I say it's it's arbitrary, and you say, well, yeah, but what you're recommending is arbitrary too. And it's a trap, so we need to get out of that. And how do we get out of that? So, and what occurred to me while watching the slides is nowhere in there is power. Uh, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> I, I assume it is, but it has to be. Yeah. yeah. Because that's one way you resolve <laughs> this. Yeah, is the big foot, um, yeah. and that's typically how it's done. The world yeah. that's it's be almost universal. So I'm going to take note though of what you said about these unwritten codes of ethics. I think that's relevant and needs to be considered here, and I think it's really useful, uh, especially when we get to the later sections of the course, talking about how we can get ourselves out of this circular reasoning because a lot of these unwritten codes are in fact instances where groups of people did get out of this unwritten or out of these circular traps you know and, and I, th I think that's worth considering we got to call it here <laughs> yes because uh, it's that time but uh We'll get back together on Friday, of course, uh, still before the time change. Apparently, <laughs> oh, apparently really? a lot of uh, phones in Canada made the time change last night. <laughs> oh, really? So there's mass confusion across the country about what time it is. Yeah, Bell Network phones it was on the news. So I'm laughing because I'm one of those who opposes changing the time because things that are not consistent really bothers me. And if one thing should be consistent in the world, it should be time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yet it points up the arbit arbitrariness of it all. Yeah. So. I think we should just all use the standard, the Unix time standard that's counting the number of seconds from January or midnight, January 1st, 1970, uh, Greenwich Mean Time. And you count the number of seconds from that point on, that's what time it is. And if you ask, you're asking me what time it is, it's like 16 billion or so. <laughs> right, it makes it hard to set up lunch. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it does. But uh, anyhow, um, but uh, I've got some catching up to do with some of the um, slides from last week. 
So I'll be sharing those in the newsletter and uh, be sharing some resources in the newsletter. Uh, I'm planning two tasks. One is to look at uh, the, the, one of the articles, uh, Felge et al., which I'll be distributing in the newsletter tomorrow. That's the one that looks at ethical codes and learning analytics specifically. Really useful to look at. Um, and then uh, another graphing task where you pick one of the ethical codes and you graph across to uh, some of the principles that it contains. Um, or I might map it back to some of the ethical issues that we addressed in the previous. That might be a better graph. Anyhow, a graphing task. That way I get to play with code as well as content. <laughs> all right, then. So, okay. And if you have anything, by all means, contact me uh, through the week as well. Okay. Talk Bye. to you. Bye. 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 Now.